So, the topic for today, this uh, today's three hours, uh, would be uh, actually we'll analyze the foundation of the semantic web. So the basic representation on which uh, everything else uh, is built. That is the RDF uh, um, framework, which is not just a language, it's not just a format, but it's basically a way of thinking, a way of uh, representing the resources that we want uh, to represent, to reason about, to search, to, to link, and so on. So actually, in the general diagram, we are near the bottom. Uh, we are in the RDF and RDF schema, RDFS, so for RDF schema, which are actually the languages from which all everything else is built. Um, on top of the RDF, actually, the word uh, splits. So we will see a lot of application domains in which uh, information is relevant in RDF or RDF schema, and then can be distributed, uh, recombined, uh, queried, uh, just using the Spark Liquid language or directly accessing the RDF trackers. And this is all the word uh, of the linked data. Hmm? Of open data, linked data, and so on, everything else. Doesn't need anything more than just plain RDF, RDF schema, and some query language. On the other hand, uh, we have all the real, real semantic application domains uh, where you actually need to do some reasoning and uh, for that uh, RDF is not sufficient uh, and we should uh, move to um, more complex languages, more powerful languages where actually we have uh, we, we bring in some logical reasoning uh, into the model itself. Uh, but actually there are the same languages for these two completely different uh, application domains. On Friday, uh, we will see this side of the picture. So, how to use, uh, uh, how to publish and uh, query distributed data sets uh, of RDF queries. Today, we will just see uh, individual, say, RDF documents. Uh, but we, uh, on, on Friday, when we talk about Spark we will see how to join uh, the, 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 the web of data, so called. Uh, that uh, links everything together. And next week, uh, we will uh, uh, climb the ladder uh, up to the ontology level and, uh, and the reason there. Hmm? So, what's about? Um, RDF is a conceptual language for representing information about resources. Hmm? Information about resources is another way of saying metadata. It's a way of presenting metadata about uh, resources of what kind? What kind of resources are, are we trying to model? Well, semantic web resources, that could be, RDF is the language for the semantic web, but not necessarily. We, can also, we, can, we could also want to, to represent metadata, information about metadata, about uh, web content. That has nothing to do with semantics. The language is simple enough, it doesn't require you to set up a semantic logical framework that we'll see uh, becomes quite complex when we talk about ontologies. But uh, we can just very simply attach some information to some objects that are available in the web. And uh, even we can, we can attach information to some objects that are not on the web. So if we want to attach some information about this bottle, I can do that. I don't think this is a web page, or this is in a, I can retrieve this bottle through HTTP. But it's an object, it's something I can talk about. Right now, I'm talking about this bottle. Okay? Me and you, we share the knowledge of the object that we are talking about. And we talk about the price, we can say that it's not totally full, uh, and we can discuss about that. Uh, so we can represent data about this object, even if it's not a, a web object, uh, it's not a web resource. It's a resource in general. What we need to do 
in RDF is to find a way to identify this button. Because for us, it's easy uh, to identify the object because we all see it. It's in front of us, it's in this room. So we can identify it by exclusion. It's the only button that we are talking about. The only one that is in my hand. I don't need to give it a name. But if I hide it, so if it's not dirt in front of us, I should have a way of identifying that. Okay, so I, RDF can also predicate about, or describe about objects that are uh, real objects, real world objects, or even not real world, or not real objects, so in things that we imagine, uh, science fiction objects or alternate universe uh, uh, objects or whatever you want, it doesn't need to exist really, as long as we can give a name to it, we can give an identification to it, we can use it in RDF and uh, predicate about it. Mm -hmm. So, it's all actually very, very simple. Uh, the data model of RDF is uh, the simplest data model that can be of universal generality. Mm -hmm. It's uh, universally general in the sense that it can represent any kind of, inter of information. So it has, oh, RDF will have the same expressive power as uh, SQL, for example. Uh, everything you can do with a relational database, you can also do with RDF, but, but more. Hmm? It's there, it has less uh, um, constraints. And, uh, but at the same time, so it's a simple language to represent information. But you could say, oh, also JSON is simple. Why don't we use JSON? We could, but behind the, the, the model of RDF, uh, there is a mathematical foundation. So, uh, everything we write in RDF, we write it very simply, we'll see with just writers of, of data, and mm, simple triplets, and, uh, but what we are writing actually is a formal model behind that. That supports the reasoning that we could do, supports the inference that we could do. So it's not any language in which we can represent a dictionary of values. It's a language in which every statement as a specific formal model. And the existence of a formal model, even if we don't, we don't understand it, and we don't need to be mathematicians or theoretical computer scientists to understand the, the semantics of RDF. If we have time, I will give you a flash of how it's modeled, but uh, hopefully we don't need to understand it. Uh, but we can understand that since we have a formal semantics, then we can apply it. Apply inference with, means transforming one representation into another representation which is richer, which is more complete, thanks to the properties of the information we have there. Hmm? We want to have this formal grounding, we want to be able to make inference, uh, but we don't want uh, this, this, layer to, this layer to uh, be um, to get in the way, actually. We don't want it to slow us down to make the language more complex. Hmm? Okay, um, so what is the idea, the basic idea about uh, uh, RDF? That uh, the first item that we need to solve is how to identify resources. We want to talk about resources, how do we identify them? Well, the, the, the basic idea was identifying resources through URIs. So, uh, we already saw last, uh, last week with Laura that the basis of all, of all uh, semantic web is identification through uh, uh, unique web-like addresses. Mm -hmm. So, we compose a name and identifier using the syntax of the URIs. So, that's protocol, slash, host, the name. They don't need to be actual web pages. They don't need to be retrievable. They only need to be unique and, and identify according to that syntax. And uh, well, there are there's one or, may, or more syntaxes for representing RDF. We sell them, we see them, of course, we need a syntax to write the language. But the important thing is not the syntax, it's not the language, it's the model. Uh, RDF is a graph model. It's a language made of graphs and links between nodes. Then we can serialize that into a text file. Okay. But it doesn't change the meaning. Huh? All the meaning, all the information that we have for, for modeling in our head is uh, in, the, in the form of graphs. 
And the other goal of uh, RDF, which is actually part of the goal of the semantic web, is that uh, it's a language that would allow anyone to make statements about any resource. So you don't need to have permission to modify your database in order to say something about some data that you have in your database. I am free to do that. I can add some information about something that you own. Nothing can prevent me from doing that. It's the same as in the web. In the web I can write a web page, I link your page and, and I start thinking or discussing about what is on your website and uh, I don't need permission to link. I don't need the, the password of your website to say something about it or to link to it. The same is about RTF. So we have every author can create different uh, facts, make different statements about other objects in a, in a, in a, sorry, a free form without any any real constraint. Of course, later the problem will be okay, but which information is correct if we have more than one? This is not a problem that needs to be solved at the RDF level. Okay, um, so the design the, uh, principles are very simple. Uh, RDF keeps uh, a very strong separation between the conceptual model, graphs, and uh, uh, the syntaxes that you can use to represent that graph. Um, another layer which is separate from the first two is the level of reasoning. Okay, the rules uh, for reasoning about these graphs. They, they have a strange name, they are called uh, entailment instead of reasoning. We see what they amount to. They are very simple, let's say, uh, transformation rules. And as a language, RDF only has two data types. We don't have uh, integers, long, and strings, and whatever. Two data types uh, URI, or URI ref, uh, means uh, URI with a fragment, hash, fragment name in the, in the, uh, in the URL, or literals, strings in quotes. That's it. We don't have a complex... We, if we want uh, to model something more complex, we create it. We describe it in the language. It's not, uh, it, mm, not a prerequisite, it's not a built-in in the language. Okay? We can create everything we want by using the language itself. So that's... You, you cannot go simpler than that. Um, of course, uh, we can also reuse uh, something that we already have. So, for example, all the, on the, in the XML world, a lot of effort went into the validation tasks. So, in XML, you, you, when you write an XML document, you probably also want uh, to have an XML schema or a DTD to validate the document, and the, that schema defines the data types that attributes or, or elements should, uh, should, uh, should uh, have. So this is already defined, existing, and RDF can use that. Can use um, XML data types for annotating uh, literals. Okay? But it's uh, something optional, it's not part of RDF uh, itself. And since we are using uh, URIs for everything, it may happen, it may happen that these URIs, if you enter them into a browser, then you get to a page that actually exists. It may happen. It's not a requirement. URIs are only used as identifiers. So these identifiers could be retrievable, and in that case, probably uh, they will get you a web page that says something or describes something about that resource for human, for human consumption. Machines don't need to go and fetch the page to reason or to understand the document. Maybe we want to understand better what the uh, URI means, so we try to look up it on the web and we find maybe a documentation page hmm, about that specific uh, app. Um, and the final point is that uh, 
since uh, anybody can add uh, statements about any resource and this is what we want uh, it's called the open word assumption okay so it's not uh, uh, we, we, which is one of the assumptions that makes uh, the semantic web much different uh, from uh, other uh, expert system domains where we know exactly where we begin and when we end uh, with the information that we have on the web we never know when it's finished mm -hmm. and uh, this, this implies that no representation, no semantic representation will ever be complete there, could all, there will be always the possibility that somebody may add something later or, or maybe somebody has already added something to this representation just I don't know it I didn't retrieve this information it's there on the web or on your computer it's there, it's written, but it's not maybe, maybe integrated with my system I didn't load it, I didn't merge it with my system so I will never know whether the, I have all the information about a specific subject so forget about uh, uh, getting or querying all the information about the subject we can query the information that is contained in a set of documents that we are currently working on and uh, the same goes for consistency if uh, anyone can make a statement about anything I cannot forbid anyone from saying that this bottle is containing wine which is false and it's inconsistent with the other information and it's also written on the label that this bottle contains water so we have two facts that cannot be true at the same time but they are they happen to be represented in RDF in our documents at the same time I cannot avoid that there's no mechanism in RDF to avoid that um, first because but very simply, I cannot, uh, I can, I can forbid you for writing this statement. Bottle contains wine. If you write that on paper or on your or on your notepad on your computer, it's written, it's there. So it makes uh, the our description of the word inconsistent. Uh, the second reason why you can guarantee consistency is that at the RDF level, we, there is no notion of consistency actually. There is no check that will tell you whether a graph is logically consistent or not. To get a notion of consistency where we can, let's say, reject some representation that self-contradict, we need to move to the ontology level. Only ontologies have the necessary logical knowledge for understanding that, for example, the contents of a bottle is unique. You cannot have two different contents unless they are equal. Uh, if there are, we have two different contents of the same bottle uh, with different values, then the representation will be inconsistent hmm? if we have such constraints. But this is not something that we can say with the RDF language. Hmm? So we need to wait until next week to think about consistency. So actually, it's a language for representing a set of information without many hmm, uh, expectations for modeling the word or modeling the truth so actually uh, the, the ingredients of RDF are just this simple list uh, the most important is uh, uh, the basic uh, construct uh, that is the tripod on which we construct everything else so a tripod is just a set of three elements that we call subject, predicate and object and uh, uh, graphically we can represent them that as a portion of a fragment of a graph hmm? when we represent uh, subject and object as overs as nodes and the predicate uh, as an arrow hmm? uh, this is just an approximation because the predicate itself uh, could be a subject for another tripod so that makes things complex huh? uh, but we'll get there so uh, 
an RDF graph or RDF document, if we want to call it like that, uh, uh, equivalent names, uh, is just a collection of tripods. It's a long list of tripods like this. A collection is not a list, uh, sorry, it's a general collection, so it's not uh, ordered. It doesn't need to be ordered. In an RDF document, order is meaningless. So if you if you shuffle the order of the of the statements of the tripods in an RDF document, uh, the resulting document represents the same graph and so represents the same it represents the same semantics, the same information. There is no notion of order, um, and there is no notion of uniqueness. So you can have the same tripod two or three or four times. Uh, you are just reasserting the same thing, but it's not, uh, it's not forbidden and it doesn't mean anything else, hmm? anything special. So, if, if we take a very simple sentence, a uh, Ridley Scott directed Blade Runner, for example, hmm? this is a statement in the English language where we can identify a subject predicate or a verb and an object. And so this can be translated in RDF if we represent uh, um, no, this is not the same, so I made the wrong picture. Um, if we represent uh, Ridley Scott in RDF as a node, Blade Runner as another node, and uh, the directed predicate as an arrow. Um, let's gain a, bit, a little bit more of terminology. Subject, predicate, object. Generally, we call subjects and objects, so everything except predicates, as nodes. Okay? So I, when I say so this is a node, this is another node that can be used as subjects or, or objects. There will be, uh, later we'll see special nodes that are called blank nodes, uh, nodes that don't bring any name. And uh, what, can, what are the, the, the possible values for subjects, predicates and objects? So the rule, this is actually the, the rule for syntactically correct RDF graphs. An RDF graph is syntactically correct if the subject of every relationship, of every predicate, is a URI or a blank node. Forget the blank node for the moment. The predicate must be a URI. The object can be a URI, a literal, or a blank node. So we have we had two data types, URI and uh, literal. Now we learn that the literal actually can only be in the object position of the tribe. The literal can never be a subject. This is just the only restriction. Everything else is a URI or a blank node. No. Um, Okay, but this is just a definition which is quite useless, uh, saying that asserting a triple hmm, means uh, that uh, the relationship uh, holds between the subject and the object. So we believe this is true. I'm saying that. I'm asserting that. I believe it's true or I act uh, as if I believe it, it were true. Hmm. Asserting a, a graph means uh, asserting the conjunction of all the statements corresponding to each and every statement. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I give you an RDF document and say, okay, I'm, this is my document, this is my truth, I'm asserting this document, means that every one of the triples mm -hmm. says a little bit of, of information about the word, and we take the intersection, so the combination, the, Simultaneous truth of all of them, those. Hmm? Um, 
So when we have some very simple fact, like before, we can express it just like, just with one uh, relationship. For example, uh, we could say that uh, if this UI represents uh, myself, for example, this represents my workplace, and uh, I can have a relationship that says, okay, the workplace of this person is this one. I'm representing real objects, a person, an institution, with a URI, with an address. In some cases, the address would be maybe quite natural. If I want to represent our university, we can use the official address of its website. Or we could use the Wikipedia address of the page describing Polytechnic of Italy. Why not? It's our choice. As long as we are consistent, we so internally use the same URI, uh, and anyone will make. Mm -hmm. When anyone is it's acceptable. Uh, and also representing people. Mm -hmm. This uh, directory.com uh, may really exist, and maybe having a directory all, of all the people in the world, or it's just the, the rest they made up. It doesn't need to exist, really. Okay? Okay, of course, the same information could also be represented in different ways. Hmm? I could have maybe a database, person, home page of the institution, or maybe some logical predicates in Prolog or in some other logical language. When I assert a predicate uh, among two different uh, um, uh, items, hmm? in that case, so in independent variables. What is the difference? That uh, in a database, if I want to represent more complex relationships, I could add uh, more columns. A logical predicate may have many parameters. In RTF, no. I can only declare a relationship between two nodes. If I want to represent a complex relationship, I must break it down into the smaller components. I must break it down into smaller sentences, into shorter sentences. Hmm? Other than that, we have some sort of a parallel uh, between the, the um, representation of information in databases and uh, in, in RDN. Uh, so, if we want to say something about uh, the Blade Runner movie, we can say that. Uh, we have a node representing the movie, this one. Uh, this is just for short, uh, it's only Blade Runner, you should list, uh, I don't know, HTTP slash uh, movies of the world slash uh, Blade Runner, whatever. A URI represented the movie. When you see a URI, you should refrain uh, from giving a meaning to that. Okay, we write Blade Runner, we could have written 1237HW, anything. It's just a node. For our convenience, we name the nodes, we give an identifier to the nodes uh, to be something meaningful to us. But it's just a convenience. Like when you name a, va a variable when you're writing a program. You choose the name of the variable. If you want, you can choose any name that has really nothing to do, but usually try to choose a name that represents the values mm, that that variable is going to hold. So this is not the name of the movie. It's a node that represents the concept of, the, of that specific movie, movie. And which movie is that? Which one? Uh, it's the one that has a name and was released on a specific date and was directed by a specific uh, director. So for describing the information, we don't assume that the node brings any specific meaning. It's just an ID, it's just an identifier. The semantics of an object, of a node, is actually described or brought by the set of relationships in which that node participates. So we describe uh, this item 
If you only see this item, we know nothing. But we have the relationships. And so we are adding metadata, we are adding information about that item. So, as long as we add, we add more information, it will become less unknown. We know more about that. And uh, the information is of two different types. In some cases, this would be literal values. This is the name of the movie. Blade Runner, I should put quotes around that. This is a specific name. This is a string. And this is a date. It's a specific value. So, some information about, some predicate, about the uh, subject could be a value. These values are terminal nodes in our graphs. Uh, they can be the destination of a predicate, the arrow, but no arrow can live from a value, from a string. So we cannot say anything about this string. We can say something about the movie, but not about the date. Cannot be the subject of anything else. Or some relationships, like this, this one, directed by, can be with other nodes. For example, this node, imagine you don't read the name, read this code, it's another node that represents the information about the entity, the person, we know it's a person, that they are directed this movie. And who is this person? For example, we can, I don't know, it's a unknown person represented by this node. And to know something about this person, I could navigate and find what information I have. For example, I have this name. Okay, so every sentence, every I thought, every information, it's represented in this way. It's a network of uh, simple pieces of knowledge. Every relationship is a bit of knowledge that we add about the subject, usually about the subject. In some cases, also about the object when the object is not a literal. Of course, uh, I, I tricked you because I told you, okay, we can understand what is this node and what is this node by looking at the relationship in which they belong. So we don't need uh, to read the Ridley Scott, it could be one, two, three, four, five, but we would still understand that this is the, is the director called Ridley Scott. I tricked you because actually we are understanding this because we understand directed name, release date, and name there. So we are using the knowledge, some meaning of the relationships Even this uh, is not the case in RDF. An RDF processor only sees these are strings, are identifiers. There's no predefined meaning for that. So we should, some way, define ourselves what's the meaning of directed by. It could be X, Y, Z instead of directed by, and would, it wouldn't change the meaning of this graph. Of course, some, in some place we should, if we want, describe something about this, this property. How it can be used, what does it represent, and so on. There's also something that could be <coughs> strange to us programmers. Name. Name and name. Is this the same property? So if, if we think in, a, in an object-oriented fashion, is name a property of this node? Is name a property of this node? Is it the same property? Or are they two properties with the same string representation? And if they are the same property, we are a bit uncomfortable because we apply a property to a movie and the same property to a person. Okay, RDF uh, is not so sophisticated, doesn't care, actually. Mm -hmm. 
we will have later a way of declaring the domain and the range of these properties or these predicates but it's perfectly fine if we use the same uh, relationship in different uh, ways it's very let's say poor as as far as the type checking is concerned okay uh, let's try to be a little more formal uh, for example i want to represent a statement uh, there's a person identified by giving you right whose name is Eric Miller and whose email is known and whose title is doctor. So, how can we represent this? Uh, we can have this node that represents a person and we can attach different information to that. So, for example, we have the name which is a literal, the title, which is a literal, and the email address, which is a URI, because it actually uh, is, uh, is an address. Uh, what didn't change? What, what did we change from the previous picture? We have, uh, as you see, we have very long uh, names here for representing the full name, the mailbox, the title. And these names were not chosen randomly, but we picked them up from some existing website. This is quite natural. As, as we start describing information about resources, the type of descriptions that we want to make uh, tends to be repeated. Having a name is normal for a person. Having a title is normal for a person. Having a birthplace is normal. Having a, a, you know, a living place and so on. And so, uh, people started to gather lists of these uh, definitions. So whenever you want to describe that a person and describe the name of that person, you can either use your own name for the property, for the predicate, you are free to do that, or you can reuse a name that you know other people are already using. So we use the same predicates, I can call them standard because uh, there's no, okay, they are published, uh, but there's no rule, there's no law, there's no enforcement that we should use those. It's our convenience, uh, instead of uh, saying, okay, I, I have a relationship called name. What does it mean? I need to explain it to other users. Here, it's easier because I can reuse a, a relationship that is already explained somewhere else. Somebody has the word, I'm just reusing the word made by, by somebody else. And this will also you know, uh, make things easier when you want uh, later to search for information. Because if you want to search, if you have uh, one person which is called uh, Julio Corno, and we want to inf uh, information about this person, okay, only having the name doesn't mean you have the URI of the person. So you'd like to find, for example, the URIs whose name is the literal string Julio Corno. And it's easy to do if uh, people model information and just use this uh, full name property you write instead of making their own app. So it's just a convenience no? for everybody to reuse those, uh, let's say, well known dictionaries. There are a few, there are four or five dictionaries that get reused over and over again. Um, we also had one other relationship here with a new one that says that this node is uh, a person we are attempting at describing the nature of this node hmm? and uh, 
with a relationship which is called type. By the way, type is one of the relationship, one of the few, very, very few relationship types that is already defined inside the RDF uh, uh, language. So this is a standard one. RDF is defined at this uh, URI here, RDF syntax, uh, and type is one of the predefined types. And, uh, and so we are trying to model it like that. Uh, graphically, we try to be consistent uh, and we present nodes uh, as uh, ovals, predicates as arrows, and literals as uh, rectangles. Um, the nodes have no type. We could be tempted to say that, okay, if this is a person and this is a instance of that class of persons, it's not true. In RDF, these are two nodes with equal rights. Okay, if we were in a programming language, this would be a class name, a class of persons, and this would be a specific person with their properties. RDF is more general than this. Both of the class and the instance are all nodes. No, this, no different. So nodes could represent, uh, say, individuals, so specific items, could represent uh, groups or classes or kinds of items. There are no different constructs for separating uh, the individual from the group. And uh, nodes can also represent some values. For example, an email, it's a, as its own URI, is represented as a, as a node. But actually, we consider it sort of a value. It doesn't. That email is not an, an object by itself in our mind. In RDF, there's no problem. Predicates are just URIs, and as we said, uh, we try whenever possible to reuse URIs that are already defined in well-known vocabularies or we can make up our own if we want to represent some information that is specific uh, to our problem. And uh, literals are just uh, strings. Actually, the strings can be annotated in two ways. So the real value of the string is just something in quotes. But RDF supports localization and uh, type declarations for these strings. So, uh, localization means is just uh, appending uh, the at with a language code, English, Italian, to the string. So, the same attribute, this attribute, uh, me, personal title, doctor, could be repeated with another arrow, me, personal title, dot, in Italian. There's nothing that constrains the cardinality of the relationships. You can write one, you can write two. Many more predicates with the same subject, with the same predicate. Um, so, it's one way of presenting alternative versions of the same literal by splitting it over the letters. Or, we can constrain this literal through a hat hat symbol. So twice the, the accent uh, sign and followed by the name of a URI of an X, uh, XML schema data type declaration. It doesn't change the nature of the object, of the literal. 27 is still a string. 37 is still a string, but a literal, because strings are no notion in, uh, in, in RDF. But they are literals whose syntax should conform to this declaration as well. So it's just a constraint on the form of the string or the literals. Not, we are not introducing integers into RDF. They are all literals. Okay, so sometimes it's a bit inconvenient to have this so simple language, but 
it's easy because then we can build whatever we want on top of that because we don't have many constraints coming from the bottom. Um, okay. I don't want to discuss this. Um, sometimes you see URI and sometimes you you see URI ref. So first of all, we, we are talking about URI with identifier because we are just we are just using them to identify objects, not to locate them. Locating something means uh, I know where it is, uh, I can retrieve it. We don't care about that. We just want to identify them, say this is equal to that or this is different from that. Identification, the basic task. URI ref is a URI to which we append a reference, an internal reference. Uh, a fragment is called uh, with a hash symbol. This is just, a, again, a convenience method because for our convenience, uh, we want to, if we want to represent uh, RDF documents in files, for example, the same document contains many declarations. And so if we want to point to one of them, we could give the URI of the file, hash the name of the symbol, the name of the object or the subject. Otherwise, we would have uh, to make up uh, many different URIs for every concept in, in declared inside the file. And it will become, you will have a, a lot of <laughs> files containing just one line each, one, one single declaration. So for our convenience, uh, we can uh, distinguish different declarations in the same file with this uh, hash syntax. And as you see there, that uh, we have the same U general portion of the URL, PIM contact, PIM contact, PIM contact, but uh, a different, uh, say, fragment. These are different identifiers. They are different from each other. We want, we, let's say, uh, deal with them as different identifiers. A, B, C. Mm -hmm. They are different. This is a hint that there are a definition where they are defined lies in the same file, which is probably accessible through this web address. Probably, maybe, it's not uh, a requirement from it yet. And uh, this simple uh, representation, so everything is a graph, and a graph is a set, sorry, a collection of predicates. It means that uh, one line, one predicate is one other one uh, simple predicate. This blue one is a graph containing three predicates. One, two, three. It happens that D is the object of the third or the second predicate and the subject of the third one. So we draw it like this. Another graph from somewhere else can also represent other predicates. So the simplest operation that we can do with RDF, which is a zero complexity operation, is just to merge the information coming from graph one and information coming from graph two. We obtain a merged graph, combined graph, just by putting together or by reading everything together we don't have to uh, be worried about consistency issues, about application issues, about uh, if the, the URI behind this node, A, is the same, identical, to the URI behind this node, then this is the same node. If the URIs are different, they would be different nodes. If uh, um, we don't have any here, if a predicate is repeated in the two graphs, it can be represented on in the same identical predicate, the same subject, same predicate, some, some object is repeated. Uh, then in the merge graph, it will go only represented once. There's no need of repeating that. So this is a, a, a model which is actually shows why RDF is open. You can you have your own graph that you created. If another fragment somewhere else 
talks about the same objects. You can just pull it in, and uh, you don't need uh, uh, to do any special work. Imagine that if you have some information in a database, and uh, some friend of yours say, OK, I also have a database with some information which is relevant. Merging the two is a complex task. You have to first understand the schema, whether they are equal or not, and then the triggers, and then the, the, const the referential constraints, and so on. So it's not something that you can just put together. But in RDF, RDF is built for this purpose. You can put them together. Syntactically, it's sound. Whether semantically it will be sound, so it will represent something meaningful, we don't care. R RDF doesn't care. We, as designers, should care by picking <laughs> carefully the, the source of the documents that we want to merge. But algorithmically, there's no problem. So this is the conceptual model, plus a couple of more additions that we'll see. And then there are the uh, representation, the concrete representations of this conceptual model. Concrete representations are the Syntaxes, serialization syntaxes. And uh, this is a screenshot that shows uh, a part of a semantic application where you can save the document, save the information in many different formats. The first ones are all valid representations for RDF. So an RDF file can be saved uh, into XML, uh, into Antripos, into Tartos, into JSON. This was an official JSON serialization for, uh, for RDF. Or can also be embedded in other contexts. For example, it can be embedded uh, into HTML pages. So into a normal HTML page that can be used by browse for browsers you can add the specific tags, specific attributes to A elements, to span elements, to div elements, to mark RDF triples. So inside the page, you have uh, RDF triples. You have statements. So there are tools that can, OK, we have the same HTML file that can go to the browser and be visualized, can be filtered by a semantic web aware application that will extract the relevant uh, information directly from the HTML. You don't need to maintain two separate resources for that. For example, this is what Wikipedia is doing. Um, so from this extra graph syntax, we can have different serializations. Let's have a look at the more complete and also probably more complex one, which is the XML syntax. So RDF over XML, represented on the lower layer, layer is, as an XML document. This is the XML fragment, one of the possible representations in XML of the same graph that we have here, this one. Uh, it's uh, an XML file at the beginning whose uh, top-level element is RDF. So this uh, is a general RDF uh, file because uh, the top-level element of the XML file is actually RDF, an RDF uh, root uh, element. And then it contains uh, several statements. Uh, first of all, we have some... Uh, we exploit XML namespaces to shorten the representation. So this is normal in XML. You, you can define XML namespace column something to represent a full URI or a fragment URI. In this case, we are defining the namespace contact to represent this string. So in the rest of the document, everywhere we see contact colon, then we should expand it, or mentally expand it, with this string. So contact full name means http wt.org 2010 contact hash full name, just concatenation. OK? 
Okay, so, uh, and this is also why these uh, URL fragments are useful. We have the document that defines a lot of uh, constructs, a lot of nodes, a lot of con concepts or relationships that we want to use. We define a namespace for that, and we just use the definitions by the namespace column element name or property name. So just to avoid having something really long. Then we have uh, this uh, um, syntax for representing uh, predicates. A predicate is made of a subject, a verb, and an object. Mm -hmm. Everything is included into an XML block. The XML block uh, could be RDF statement, the name of this element, or in this case, uh, we have something more specific, it's not just any statement, it's a person because we have the type uh, reference. But this can be actually anything. The real uh, triple is defined by the about property. So we have a person who, the subject, we are declaring a statement. The subject of the statement is this URI. Here. What are we saying about this person? Well, in, inside, nested inside this element, uh, we have other XML elements that correspond to the different uh, predicates. One, two, three predicates about that specific subject node. The first one is a predicate of uh, dropping contact full name. And the object of this predicate is uh, the content, the textual content of the element. Maybe I remove the, you see the here, contact full name is the name of the predicate. Eric Miller, the body, the text body, the text content of this element is the value, because it's a literal value in this case. And so we have one subject with three different predicates that use that subject that, uh, that uh, node as a subject. Uh, in this other case, the object is not a literal, but is a URI. Okay, the email, you remember, was not a literal. And so in this case, we use the RDF resource attribute. So actually, RDF about is the subject, RDF resource is an, the object of the predicate. The element name is the predicate name. So this is the, the simple rules. Uh, implicitly, the fact that we are using contact person instead of RDF statement, which could be also a possibility, is an implicit uh, type declaration. Mm? Represents uh, the type uh, predicate mm? without needing to, to, to say that explicitly. We could also have added here in contact personal title Another line, RDF type of a uh, person. So, for example, if we want to look at some uh, real uh, RDF data. Uh, one thing we could do is to use uh, this uh, GeoNames website. GeoNames is a uh, Okay, geographic information. What is that? Yeah. A geographic information database. Okay. So we can look up uh, geonames.org about uh, any, for example, Torino, if you want. And gives us all the information that they have about. Uh, this uh, city. Hmm? And if we go there, it shows that on the map. It's, uh, okay, so it's here. These are all the items that in some way refer hmm, 
tutorial. Okay, but this is just a uh, you know, geographic information system. The nice thing is that uh, uh, this is uh, powered by, by an ontology. So if you go there into any of these elements, for example, this is the, okay, the Biblioteca Nazionale, this one could be the, this uh, is the node for the city itself, fourth order administrative division. Hmm? So the administrative division will be uh, the continent, uh, the country, the region, and then the cities. And so this node uh, represents actually the city. Hmm? And you see that uh, we have one RDF uh, link here. So from this interface, uh, we can, in this case, in this case sa save uh, an RDF file and look at it. So this is the representation of the information about the city of Torino stored in this GeoNames database. So what, uh, what does it do? Well, first of all, it's a RDF document. It defines some namespace. And we see that most of them will be the same everywhere. And then there are information about this resource. You see that the top level, let me break it down a little. There are only two top level levels. This, uh, if I collapse the XML file, we, have, we only have two top level elements behind the root. One is this URI and one is the other one. This is uh, metadata about the document. So it will probably have information about the creation date, the author and the revision version, not of the city of Torino, but of these RDF document uh, representing uh, Torino, probably. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, uh, we said the license, uh, uh, the, the creation date, modification date, and so on. So this is not information about uh, Torino, it's information about this RDF file that has been stored in the system. It's not relevant to us. Uh, this is uh, actually, the content of this uh, is actually the real, so let's make space for it, let's separate it, is actually what this website has to say, as knows about the city of Torino. First of all, Nobody can recognize that we are talking about the city of Torino. This is a URI that represents the city of Torino in GeoNames, in the semantic uh, database of, of uh, GeoNames, but we, you can tell, I can tell. It's just an identifier. Okay? This is the normal case. Well, it's not. Uh, Blade Runner, the, the, the name of the URI. Usually it's something very opaque like this. But then, so this is the subject. This subject has a lot of predicates. Is defined by, okay, this is just saying, okay, all the information about this subject is in this resource, which is the file that we just downloaded. Uh, Okay, this is the name, was the, ah, the name of the circoscrizione, not of the city. I picked the wrong one, sorry. Uh, so it's the name of uh, in Torino, circoscrizione 1, probably, or 2, not, uno, one. So we have the property name, Centro Crocetta, feature class, feature code of, uh, so we see that uh, this one is a predicate with a literal object. The predicate is name, the object is a gender project. The second one, line 11, is a predicate with a URI object. Okay? 
feature class is the predicate genames ontology dash a is uh, means administrative division in this ontology uh, uh, represents uh, the object feature code administrative division for country code literal latitude longitude are literals parent feature parent country parent administrative division one two three so we see that we are an administrative division of level four that we are inside an administrative division of level three which is this one this could probably be the city we try to reference it This is the administrative third order administrative division. It is the city. So let, let me download that for later. Okay. And we see that, for example, the parent feature is the same as the administrative tree feature. You see, the URI 5525, 5525 is the same node. Hmm? We said that the parent of this node is this one, which, by the way, is also the administrative division on level three that contains this one. And uh, uh, it doesn't happen with the country. Okay, and then later we say, okay, what are the features inside? So what's inside this administrative division? So there will be any, maybe, uh, off post office, maybe some museums, some schools. Uh, where are them? Okay, they are here, contained in this file. Actually, they are represented by this node, and this node happens to be the name on RDF file, and if you, if you read that file, you will get the information. And also, if you, if you want to see this resource onto a map, you can call this HTML file. So, this is our own interpretation. It's something that I have. I saw location map HTML, so I think that this attribute, this property here, Give me the address of web page that can load to see the location of the element. But it's not something that is implicit into the, the RDF file. If we want to see it better, uh, we can use a, a, a service by the W3C, which is called the RDF validator. The validator is a, it's a tool for actually helping you write correct uh, uh, RDF. But if you cut and paste uh, some fragment of uh, RDF uh, and one limit is uh, it, it only supports the XML syntax and you say that you want to sh see the tripos on the graph parse it will give you the content of this file as we imagine it at least of triples, it's flat things. So it all, uh, reads all the uh, all the XML and converts that into triples. Of course, it's not very readable because the URI names don't mean anything. And below we see the the graph representation. Okay, it's impossible to to see it all and read it all at the same time. latitude longitude we saw that for example parent administrative tree and the parent feature are the same parent country is here administrative no sorry parent country where is that parent at the end here parent feature here parent country is this one administrative one administrative two and so on so this is a tool for helping us to, to make sense of the RDF that we find. 
and in some cases we see that most of most of this graph is talking about this node so all the arrows starting from this node but also there are some other predicates for example this node has a attribution url in that in the other direction so it's actually the, the about node says okay i am about what i am about uh, this city and oh this is all the information linked to the about node information about the the document itself as we said at the beginning hmm? uh, if we load the, the other one it's not much longer so it, this is uh, the one for the torino as a city uh, all of them no, are pieces of information that we could put together or the system could put together to to have the the bigger picture for, let me try to merge them it should work okay, take this feature okay, add the feature from the torino city to this one let's see what happens copy everything from here to here I copy it here and take everything and try to pass it to the validator okay we have twice the triples of course and then the graph uh, starts to show some structure we don't see that but we have uh, this which is the Centro Rocetta and this which is the city we have this one as a parent feature that so this means that that on the top is the parent of this one on the bottom and so on and these are all the properties of the other some of them are shared but they are reconverted uh, lines and so on so uh, we can imagine that as we create more information we are linking more all the nodes that we have some nodes uh, we, we merge two graphs actually without any effort just cutting and pasting the statements and the merge operation the interpretation of the graph auto automatically identifies the nodes that are, that, are, that are declared with the same URI as being the same node this is the meaning of identifier the, the name identifies uniquely the object Okay, so we did it with Torino. Oh, yeah, last last week, uh, you you you, you selected, you declared your perfect vacation. So probably uh, for for playing, you could try to find uh, some information about uh, your vacation destination. Hmm? Um, just uh, one last topic before we have a break. Uh, we say that XML is one of the syntaxes is the even the most complex one um, and if we had to write xml rdf xml by hand uh, it would be very painful so uh, since the real rdf is the graph concept uh, all the time many simple syntaxes were defined with the same expressive power one with which is quite successful is the so-called uh, Tarkle notation, Tarkle construction of terse and the F tribal language, uh, where of course terse <laughs> was opposed to the XML, which is very uh, long uh, as representation. And actually, it's just a list of triples. So we have uh, four statements uh, in this case, uh, four predicates. And each of them is represented by a subject, a predicate, and the object. URIs are enclosed in uh, angular brackets. Literals are enclosed in double quotes, full stop at the end of each statement. That's it. 
this is all the syntax that we need in this case. Okay? Uh, usually you could write them one by line. So actually, it's, uh, it's this representation. You just need to add uh, some angular brackets mm, around this device, but uh, this would be the table representation of the same node. What happens? Uh, first, uh, this is boring because we have to cut and paste long URIs every time. So the turtle syntax, okay, this is just a grammar tree to, to show that it's simple. Um, the turtle syntax allows for the definition of prefixes instead of namespaces that we call them in, as uh, we call them in XML, here we call them prefixes. So at the beginning of the file, we have some at prefix statement, meta statement, defining, for example, a contact prefix uh, with this URI or URL fragment. And so inside the tripos, instead of pasting every time all these long barbels here, we just can use just the prefix name. Mm. So it becomes shorter and it becomes readable, mm, which is quite useful. And uh, the second the source of uh, redundancy is that uh, we have four statements that relate to the same subject. So Tartar allows uh, merging them, just from the syntax point of view. I say, okay, if I have a second or a third uh, statement that, by chance, has the same subject as the previous one, it can omit the subject and uh, use a semicolon instead of a full stop to close the previous statement. Okay, so semicolon means this statement is closed, and the subject of the next statement is the same as the previous one. So if I have a list of predicates with all the same subject, which we see is not uncommon, because for our two names, uh, we had uh, 20 statements with the same subject, uh, we can save a lot of writing, and also a bit clearer, okay? It stands out. Uh, there's another, uh, say, Contraction that can be done, simplification can be done. What happens is, by chance again, we have the same subject but also the same predicate. Maybe this person has two different titles in two different languages. Maybe this person has two different email addresses. So if I have a second email address, I should have to repeat contact mailbox with the second address. So there is a, another contraction that says, if you want to reuse the same subject and the same predicate as the previous statement, it's a comma. So comma here ends this statement and say that the next statement will have the same subject as this one, which by the way is the same statement, uh, the same subject as the first one, and the, first, the same predicate as this one. We only need to specify a different object. Uh, so it's quite easy and also terse, as the name says, uh, uh, is something that we can have to afford writing by hand without too many mistakes. Okay? Many tools, of, of course, offer the conversion from one format to the other because uh, at the end of the game they are all uh, equivalent to each other. Okay? Uh, there is also another format, which is older, in this. it's called n triples which is a uh, very similar to turtle but without the contraction so we can the actually the first example that i show is uh, also in the n triple format so this is the basic format turtle only adds uh, some shortening rules so this is file is both in turtle and in n triple form uh, this, of course, is easier to parse, simpler to parse. So, if, if you want to uh, process some semantic data and you don't want to interpret all the semicolon, columns, and so on, you can save it in this longer format, uh, which is actually this table again. Okay, imagine that. By the way, what uh, RDF storage tool 
do, do actually, algorithmically, when you load a document, an RDF document, usually these tools parse the document and store it like that in a database, in a SQL database somewhere. You give it a database backend and they will store it in three columns. So actually, it's a one to one mapping uh, between the uh, Entrivers format and the real say, uh, representation of the RDF data into a tri tripostal system. Of course, plus all the indexes, all the uh, let's say, uh, algorithms that, that, uh, that the backend will do. Okay. Um, so I would propose maybe a, a short break and uh, so we get a coffee or something like that. And during the break, when you go, when you come, we can start thinking about this. Okay? And then we will do it together uh, after the break. So that this is a statement that I took it an old but scary news. Still hurts reading this when Oracle bought Java and uh, it meant uh, the, the death of many things uh, not in the open source world. And uh, if uh, we what what could we do if we want to represent this information using RDF? So let's try to draw a, a graph or write some turtles to represent this information and see how maybe we everyone maybe can find different solutions or how we present some information okay so 11 11 38 let's say 5 to 12 okay <laughs>